Hey, it's Jeff Hyman, your startup therapist, where we focus on the people part of startups. And we have a phenomenal guest today who is immensely qualified to discuss the people part of startups. Noam Wasserman, how are you? Fine, thank you. How are you, Jeff? Great. I am honored and a bit humbled to talk with you because a lot of your work has inspired my decision to uh, become startup therapist and to work with founders and focus on the people part of startups. So I am delighted to spend some time with you. Uh, let me quickly uh, let folks know who you are because I think that'll set the context. And then what we're going to talk about today are the big, hairy people problems and dilemmas that face founders, especially when they're getting off, off the ground, that eventually sink their startup. And if you can avoid some of these things, you have a much better chance of success. So that's kind of the theme of today's discussion. You literally wrote the book, Noam. Uh, it's called The Founder's Dilemmas. It's a best-selling book. I highly recommend it. The Founder's Dilemmas, Anticipating and Avoiding the Pitfalls that Can Sink a Startup. This book is tied to your work at Harvard Business School, where you're a professor. You teach this class. How many years have you taught the class? Seven years. Got it. And from what I understand, this is based on a body of work that you've done for about 10 years, understanding and tracking uh, startup failures to try to connect the dots on some of those key issues. And it's based on a principle that I think many people don't know, that 65% of startup failures are led or driven by people problems. So it's not customer acquisition, it's not product market fit. We can talk about all those things in there. Of course, they're vital. But if you come down from those to, to the more essential, it's people problems, founder problems. Is that right? Yeah, no, absolutely. You're getting into a little bit the trigger, the spark Good. for why I headed into this domain. Good. Um, the, the book that you're referring to is actually a decade worth of research that went into that, but now it's been 15 years, uh, and so it's been... Uh, coalescing for a decade and a half worth of my life. Good. Uh, to give you a little bit of that origin, um, the back uh, about back in almost 25 years ago, uh, there was a guy who's now a close colleague of mine named Bill Selman who uh, was taking a look at what was back then a black box um, of knowledge in terms of understanding venture capitalists. What do venture capitalists go and do? Yeah. And Bill did a very long paper looking inside that black box at everything from how do they get deal flow to how do they evaluate the deals, how do they negotiate the term sheets, how do they work with the entrepreneurs once they make their investment. Along the way, he fortunately thought to ask a question that became fundamental for me, and that was, let's, we've gotten into all the parts of your portfolio that you'll talk about. Let's now talk about the parts you won't talk about. Right. Let's talk about the failures. <laughs> VCs, VCs don't talk about that. Exactly. <laughs> You're not going to go and post a press release on your site these days right. about the latest milestone. Because their milestone is that they hit the dustbin of history. They're going to be a zero <laughs> on your, in your LP quarterly statement. Um, and so to the extent that there's all sorts of ways that we might be able to learn something from it, let's go and understand the sources of those failures. Think also about what that sample that he was looking at is. These are the highest potential adventures. These are the ones that were able to go and attract that rare VC yeah. dollar, the top of supposedly 1% of all ventures, and yet they still failed. Yep. And so what are the reasons that those even highest potential ventures fail? Yep. Think also about what VCs focus on. If you ask them what are they evaluating, first thing that they will usually say is the team, the people. And so Bill went in with his own ideas of what he's going to find for those sources of failure. Uh, things today that we would call product market fit issues, all the types of things that get lots of attention. Um, and he did find that those were indeed on the list. A little more than a third of the reasons for failure were product market fit or functional issues as they're trying to coalesce as the product is being developed or once it's developed and you have to build a company, things like that. But he found one preponderant reason for failure. And that was that number that you were talking about there. 65% of the reasons for failure were the people issues, the naughty interpersonal tensions between the founders or the frictions between them and the people who were brought on board after them to come and complement the company. And it was those sticky human issues. Right. So, that, it, so it, I, I assume it was broadly defined, right? It's founder issues or co-founder issues, recruiting issues, getting the right people in the right seats on the right yeah, on the bus uh, or getting the wrong ones off. So it was... Uh, Broadly defined, but basically people problems, if you crack that, you have a much higher likelihood of success. That was his basic conclusion. Yes, exactly. Great. The so, thing is that as yeah. I started looking into what do we know about these, and th in his paper it was just one line that mentioned it and then one number in a table. So I went looking for, okay, who's built on this? What other new things have we learned about these things and found nothing there? Got it. And what it turns out is that we don't even know what questions to ask about those people problems. 
We don't know what are the ways in which there are decisions that people are making that are going awry, and what are the ways in which we can then come up with actionable solutions to be able to go and avoid those pitfalls. And when I saw that, there's nothing being done on it. And this also goes back to my own firsthand experiences as a founder, that it echoed for me a whole bunch of the things that I had faced and said to me that this is a key domain. We don't know anything about it. I'm going to have to go and make the inroads right. in that. And it's tough, right? Because these are these are tough things to talk about because they're they're emotional. They're filled with angst as opposed to objective product market fit things or customer acquisition. And also, uh, they they're they're just subjective. They're harder to measure. They're harder to kind of get your arms around. And it involves some very tough discussions, maybe between two co-founders, between manager and employee, et cetera. This is the messy side of business. Jack Welch would tell you that this is business. If you don't get this right, what are you wasting your time, right? Yeah, no, I remember when I was in the midst of when I was doing it, um, thinking I'm unique. I'm the only one facing this. There's going to be no real recurring lessons that I could go and learn from other people and things like that. Um, it was then when I was working in a VC firm and I was seeing founding team after founding team coming through, talking to them about their histories, about their backgrounds, about the things that they were facing just then, that I started seeing, no, there are recurring patterns. Right. There are ways in which every founder thinks he's unique, but where I'm seeing things that are decisions that tend to have outcomes, that tend to be ways in which you can go and think harder about it to begin with. And so that was the, the, those are in some ways the three stages of yep. my realization with this. The first-hand experiences, the second-hand observations across a bunch of founders, and then the realization from that paper about this is a critical domain that we have to go and really make some inroads into. I've read your book and I've watched all your videos and studied your, your material. My conclusion or, or my impression is that so much of this is the upfront part, structuring things early in the venture appropriately, but with some flexibility, et cetera. Is, 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 that, is that a reasonable conclusion that if you kind of get on the wrong track, it's very hard to pull it back in, but if you deal with some of these things early in the venture, which is unusual because you're so busy doing a million things, you're developing the product and you're selling and you're trying to raise money and P.S. you're supposed to nail the, down these people problems, but if you don't get it right up front, it seems like it's pretty tough to fix. Yeah, no, when it comes to the people decisions you make, it's really hard to hit the undo key for most of them. Got it. There are a lot of other decisions. This is several of the things that I want to go and pull apart. A, where is it really hard to hit the undo key? Yeah. And so therefore having the foresight is particularly critical. If it's easy for you to go and make a mistake and then recover from it, that's not something that's high on my list of the things that I want to go and research and educate people about. It's the things that are really tough to go and undo yep. that are critical for it. But there's also a recurring theme across these decisions that – when we go and default to just what feels right, what is the easy way to go, what is the short-term decision, that when it comes to these people issues, those happen to be the most ill-fated. Yeah, sure. Those happen to be the ones that are going to come back to bite you. Right. And so if we can go and have you have a roadmap of where those are, where the key decisions that you can't undo are, and then think harder before you go and default to what gut says and what the intuition says that that's what we want to help you pull back on. Right. So there's so many sub points. Let's get specific and let's get practical and make it as actionable as we can for our viewers who are typically founders and investors. Uh, there's so many we're not going to cover them all. So I highly recommend people read Founders Dilemmas to really get their arms around the whole body of work. But let me start with one and then we can cover some others. And that is uh, the founder co-founder decision. Do I start this venture alone? Or do I found it with others? And then the second part of that seems to be, who do I co-found it with? Do I pick my buddy who we hang out and we brainstorm ideas? Or do I strategically recruit someone to be my co-founder who complements my, my strengths, et cetera, et cetera? So what, what did you find in, in all your research about those two things? Sure. No, absolutely. We're, we're fast forwarding a little bit to like when we're founding. Oh. There's a whole slew of things about... You know, even preparing to found yeah. a bunch of the pitfalls around that. So should I even be people, should I even be an entrepreneur is is a is a, pre, a key people question. And then if I am going to be so at each of these stages along the way, we're injecting in a brand new player into yeah. the equation. Yeah. The first of the players you're injecting in is yourself. Yeah. And so figuring out, do I have what it takes? If not, might I be able to get myself to that point by? having a different developmental path, having different career experiences and things like that. Yep. And then when within that path might be the right time to go and do it. How do I weigh the professional, the personal, all of the things that are going to have to be the intersecting dynamics across it when I'm making that decision about whether to go into it. But now let's just assume that you've gone and 
built a good foundation with your pre-founding career, yep. uh, that you've done, gone and done it when it's good for you in the personal life to go and do it. Um, yes, that first fork in the road is, should I go and do it on my own, what I call the Superman option? Yeah. <laughs> Take the weight of the world onto your own broad shoulders as you go and try to leap that tall building in your own single bound. Yep. Or am I going to go and get a helping hand? Am I going to go and find some other people to go and co-found with me? Um, this gets a little bit into, let me go start injecting in some data. Yeah, please. Into, one of the please. other key things that uh, I find is critical is for us to be able to separate out where are the right decisions, where are the wrong decisions. Um, we can go by anecdote. We can just go by listening to rules of thumb, but it's very different to go and actually see what the data tells right. And so the data that I've collected, systematic data on thousands of startups and founders, um, and this is where, to give you a little bit of a context for it, it's within the U.S., so I don't know how yep. many of your, no, uh, most... your viewers are outside yep. the U.S., yep. but it's coming from U.S. startups, and it's coming from the two biggest uh, industries for high potential startups within the U.S., from high tech and from life science. Okay. Within for... those two industries, I find that it's very much the path less taken for it to be a solo founder. Hmm. And I find that only 16% of those ventures are solo founded. And instead, 84% of the founders have said head down a different path of going and trying to find at least one co-founder to go and do it together with them. Right. Uh, the numbers I've seen in terms of some of the research, there's a little bit that's been done on small businesses, family businesses, things like that. Um, that's where the percentage is a bit higher in terms of the solo. Uh, but even then, it's very much the exception, and it's far more the rule that you're going to be trying to bring on the next type of person, the co-founder, to right. be able to do things with you. So it's kind so of a six. It's like a six to one ratio or a seven to one ratio. I mean, it's it's there's no comparison yeah. that most people co-found. Yeah. Okay. In a lot of ways, there's a very seductive thing about solo founding. Because you can go and avoid a whole bunch of other decisions that you're going to have to face compared to if you're going and co-founding. Right. Um, when you're co-founding, the key three realms that I found within my research of decisions you're going to face are what I call the three R's. There's the relationships that you are tapping when you're going and finding the co-founders. There are going to be the roles and decision-making, the way that you're going to be architecting that mm -hmm. within the team. And then there's going to be the rewards. Yep. Typically the financial rewards, but also other rewards. Typically within the financial, there's the equity split sure. part. The all and the all important equity d uh, division between the founders. Exactly. And within those three realms, that is where the default decision that founders tend to make, the data show that the most common decisions they make, happen to also be the ones that are the most fraught with peril. Mm. So for instance, within the relationships decisions, the biggest bars on my bar charts of how often do we have different types of relationships within teams are the friends and family types of teams. That is the most that's commonly, people, that's the most common type of co-founders. Previously, they were friends or family. Exactly. Uh, hopefully not just previously family, hopefully still well, family. Yeah. <laughs> but to the extent that what you're doing is tapping the social realm, the people that you yep. know socially, and going and finding them, it's a very natural place to look. The people who are near and dear to you, the people who are nearby, you think you already know each other, you think the trust is there, you... Uh, have heard that within founding teams, trust is critical. Yep. Let me go to people I already have it with, the people I know very well. And, and the logic kind of makes sense, right? It's like, yeah. right? I've known yeah, these absolutely. people, I've, I've been in a bunker with them socially, or I've known them a long time. Yes, and so it's a very natural place to go. And within my data set, more than 50% of the teams are those friends and family types of teams. Mm -hmm. When I look, though, also at the stability of teams, I go and take a look at the friends and family teams versus all other teams. Yep. Um, friends and family happen to also be the least stable of the types of teams. So let's define let's, let's define stability. Does that mean they break up at some point? So that means at least one founder leaves. Okay. Okay. So the the most common of the teams, the ones, the social basis for them, happens to be the most perilous of teams. That it is the one that is the least stable. And when we go and break that apart, a couple of the reasons that underlie that is the bold assumptions that we make when we are going and co-founding with the people that we seem to know very well. One assumption that we make is that the realm that we know them really well in, the social one, maps very nicely into the professional realm. Right. That the ways in which we have seen them interact with us socially, that's going to be what they're like in the office. And if you think about it, if you've ever gone, and the one time that I went and uh, spent a little bit of time uh, with my parents, seeing them at work. <laughs> a little bit surprising that they're not quite what they are at home. Yeah, sure, 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 sure. Um, and so there's the, our bold assumption that this is going to map from one to the other. There can be a lot of ways in which we're surprised by that. I remember also I had one of my daughters was a summer intern at HBS a few years ago. I remember finding myself having to go and 
uh, I was realizing that when she was around, I was much more conscious about how I was interacting with right. my colleagues. Right. All sorts of ways in which when we inject in that social, it's actually where we find the disconnects to the to the professional. So you found uh, and also several bold assumptions that we make about. We know them very well. We don't have to go and road test each other. We don't yeah. have to go and date each other in the professional realm first. We can just really dive in. And the most striking for me when I was doing those analyses of team stability is that if I went and added in a third type of team, you co-found with someone who's just an acquaintance or even a stranger of yours, the friends and family teams are even less stable than those types of teams. Wow. Oh, my gosh. Even less stable than people that we really don't know well. When you think about those strangers and acquaintances when you're going and engaging with them, you're going to go and see your way through. Let's date a little bit. Right. Let's get to know each other, whether our styles are similar or not. Let's go and make sure that we are engaging in this after putting toes in the water before diving in, whereas the family ones, the friends ones, we're going to dive right in, making the bold assumption that we don't have to date, that we don't have to feel our way through this. I'm guessing that uh, there's just so many tough discussions you need to have in a startup that it must be difficult to have those with family and friends because you have a, the broader context. You don't want to lose their that relationship and so you might hesitate in what I call entering the danger we're having these tougher discussions and that can create just a cancer that builds within the startup venture over time is that safe to say yeah no absolutely okay. so we were just talking about one element that'll keep you from having the difficult conversations yeah. that's the bold assumption we don't need to have it right then there's a second factor which is the one you're highlighting which is that are we going to be able to go and bring up these really tough issues I with see. The people who are near and dear to us and how do we get people over that hurdle? Usually, when I have a room full of entrepreneurs that I'm talking to, I ask who is easier to go and have these conversations with, someone who is near and dear to you within the social realm yep. or someone you barely even know. Yep. And they say the hands across the board are the person I don't really know. I'm not good at having conflict-ridden conversations with the people who are near and dear to me. I see. Let's, let's um, shift to another topic that's connected uh, but because there's so many things I want to try to cover in the time we have. Let's presume that... The decision's been made to co-found the business. It sounds like that's the most common. I think you said 85% or so. 84%, yeah. Right. Uh, and let's assume that we've made the decision uh, of who, who those co-founders are going to be. From the research, what's the next group of things we should think about in terms of decisions or conversations early in the venture that will help improve our odds of success or, as you define it, team stability uh, later? You mentioned one earlier, which is equity split discussion. I'm sure there's a bunch of others. What did you learn from, from your research? Well, those other two realms that we had referred to within the three R's, um, there's the roles in decision making. Yep. How are we going to be splitting up the collective decision making, the titles, the positions within the venture? Um, and then there's the rewards piece of it they were referring to, the equity split part of it. Yep. Um, within the roles, just very briefly, um, the most common way, and it's also an understandable short-term decision, is that we're all going to be in this together. One founder, one vote. We make decisions by consensus. Yeah. Uh, we're even maybe co-CEOs. Right. In the Just, doesn't that sound good? Co-CEOs. <laughs> yes. It's a, What could be better than right. to do that together with my best friend? And I tend to call that setup the Neverland setup, uh, where Peter Pan lived, where it's all kids, there's yeah. no parental supervision, <laughs> there's no hierarchy there. And in some ways, it's a very natural thing for us to go and see, yes, that's a way that you want to architect it early on. The give and take across equals is a great way to have, hopefully, creative conflict in terms of the decisions you're going to make early on. Yep. But then what happens when things start growing? What happens when you get to 10 people? Are you going to keep living in Neverland? It's going to get really tough to be doing that. There's going to be heightened tensions as you add people to this and equal decision makers to it, or where you have all sorts of ways in which it's going to slow you down. Yep. And so to the extent there that now we have to transition to another decision-making approach, the hierarchy, someone clearly yep. being in charge, the buck stops somewhere, or there's a tiebreaker and things like that. And someone's going to have hard feelings, the, right? Well, the, the key thing is it seems the most rational model to go and move to, but when you start off in Neverland, all sorts of ways in which everyone except the figure at the top of Mount Olympus, except for Zeus, is going to feel like they've been demoted yeah, sure. to all be part of these decisions. And now what happened? What? Why am I now subordinate to someone else when it comes to these? I'm no longer seeing the magic of being fully engaged in all of the things that are part of what I wanted to get into with this. And so that is where that short-term decision that seemed to make all the most sense in the world, actually when you move to the longer-term model, heightens tensions rather than reduces it goes and causes all sorts of ways in which the 
expectations are getting blown up in which the social inertia is going to come back to haunt you and yep. constrain you from being able to do it. And so that's one of the key ways in which it's a microcosm when you're looking at the roles in decision making about what the common decision leads to if you don't have the forethought about the road down the path, down the path and what it's going to lead you to. Was the data uh, of all these thousands of startup failures and startups, was the data predictive or, or indicative of should you even go down the journey with co-founders under that co-CEO, we're all equal structure, or should you not even try? In other words, should you basically force the decision at the beginning, what are the roles and responsibilities, and if we can't figure out, let's all go our separate ways? So it's not quite that extreme, and this is where a lot of things we've been talking about is where we're taking black and white. There's very much like a other gray area realms, but it actually intriguingly is often the path less taken even to go into gray area yeah. and finding a mix across those. Uh, within the roles in decision making, the best way early on, and this also depends a little bit on division of labor, are we overlapping in the things that we're doing or do we have clear domains? Uh, the best type of an early approach is to have more a Zeus within each domain. To have someone who's going to be the key decision maker. So if you have the CTO, the ace techie who's getting together with the business person, that when we have each of our domains that we can go and be making decisions within that domain, but then there are also going to be decisions that are cross-domain. That's where we're going to have to come together. That's where we're going to have to go and be able to coordinate across the two of us. That's where you have all sorts of other issues that come up when those types of things are happening. If it's two founders, yep. what happens when it's one-one? How are we going to break yep. that tie? Yep. Thinking ahead of time down the road to that and having a mechanism in place of should we add in a third leg to the stool? Is there going to have to be a way in which we can go and figure out an alternative approach to a 1-1 one -one gridlock? Um, that's one of the things early on to set up on the way to being able to be much more effective than what the typical Neverland is. Let's let's shift in the final minutes to the final R, which is rewards. And again, we could talk for days about that. I'm interested specifically in the equity division amongst founders because that's such a crucial and frankly emotional uh, decision. Uh, what were some of the key findings from the data on startups that did uh, have stability and that did kind of go the distance? What did they do differently that maybe some of the other startups did not? Okay, so let me give you a few of the stats that capture what is the st what is the standard, yeah. and then we can talk about what the flaws are in the standard. Uh, first of all, 73% of the startups in my data set split the equity right at the beginning. Split it within a month of founding. Which would seem to make sense, right? We're starting a company. Let's figure out how we're going to divide it. Exactly. And so that's one of the common ways in which they do it. Um, not quite the majority, but um, a very consistent with that is, what do you think is the most common way that those founders, during the beginning of it, go and split it? Take the pizza and split it equally, based on the number one of founders. One over N rule. Uh, that's the best that we can tell right now. It seems fair. Let's go and do the one over N rule. Yep. It wasn't quite the majority, but it is a very big piece of those uh, those uh, those founders who are going and splitting it early on, and actually the chance is that you're going to split it one over n go up a whole bunch when it is that first month of the venture yep. compared to later on when you are going and splitting it. And then also the majority of those ventures, despite the fact that they're splitting it when uncertainty is the highest at the way beginning, and they're making the bold assumption that we're all going to be in this committing in the same level, yep. that we're all going to be contributing the same amount of value. They don't allow for any mechanism to be able to go and adjust it. It's essentially what I call a static split. Yep. Uh, let's go and put this in place, and let's assume that no matter where the venture is going to be going, that that's going to be the fair way to go and do it. And so they don't allow for any of those uncertainties, any of the surprises, to uh, go and adjust what is going to be the ownership within it. And as it turns out, all three of those approaches, all three of the, like when you're in that realm of all three of those dimensions of doing it early on, splitting it equally, and making it static, those are the teams that are the least stable, that get hit the most when they're raising a round of financing yep. by a major penalty in terms of the valuation they're going to be able to get at that point, and the ones that face the biggest issues in terms of the tensions within the team. So to make it actionable, and then we're going to wind down the interview, uh, what what is the alternative to that? So what is a founder or what, what are co-founders to do if it's not just an equal split, one over N, as you say, in, in the equity? What's just an example of an option uh, or, or a different scenario? So there are two key dimensions. Well, the second one is more important, but the two key dimensions that I uh, push the founders, my students, to, to go and do in terms of their approach to it. The first is to go and have the difficult conversation around where are we going to be unequal? Where are we maybe yep. not going to be all contributing the same value? 
where we maybe not going to be fully committed to it in the same way. Go to your co-founder who is just then having his first kid be born yeah. and have it uh, really <laughs> this conversation with that person about, are you really going to be up for founding a family at the same time as we are going and founding a venture? Yeah. Go to the person that you know, they really like their day job and say to them, are you really going to quit it? Yeah, sure. Board, or am I going to be the only full-time founder? Go and have those difficult discussions sure. about fitment, about contribution, the value. I'm more senior than you. Or you're more senior than me. Yeah. If we have all sorts of ways in which that's going to translate into someone who's going to be a more critical, central player, who has industry experience where the other one doesn't, other things along those lines, have a difficult conversation about the unequal sides of the team rather than just succumbing to the natural pull towards equality and the assumption of fairness. So that's the first of the dimensions. The second of them is acknowledge the uncertainties that you face mm -hmm. and that you have all sorts of things that are going to come up down the road that could blow up all the most elegant static agreement that you're going to be creating. Go and define what are those biggest risks, go and prioritize them, and then go and tackle the biggest of those and talk about if this hits, how are we going to go and react to it? Well, so for well, instance, well, the so risk of you going and uh, of your having that day job that you're not going to be able to part from. So you're almost describing if-then statements, right? It, it, like, that's, if, that's a great way to catch it. So going to one of the teams that I studied very early on of this. So I have a computer science background. I started life as a, as a techie. And when I saw their founder agreement, there was one page of it that leapt out at me as a series of if-then-else statements. Essentially, they went through their biggest risk about whether the idea guy, a guy right. named Ken, yeah. was going to be on board. It was the two things that I was just referring to now. He was becoming a first-time father, and he really liked his day job. Yep. And so his two co-founders had doubts about whether he's going to come on board. And so they had the difficult conversation first in the expected case scenario. How much are each of us going to be contributing to the venture? And then second of all, let's take this biggest risk, Ken. Let's go and talk about it. Let's go and paint the first scenario of if Ken is on board full-time, all the yep. rosy scenarios that we would all love to hope is going to go and be what we're going to experience, then this is what the equity split will be. Else, if you can are on, only on board part-time, then this is how the equity will adjust and what the split will be. Else, if you're not on board at all, Ken, our biggest worst-case worry, then these are the terms by which we'll buy back your stock. Got it. And so, so going with the scenario-based planning, uh, for them, the risks map the best to going through those if-then-else statements in terms of scenarios and see what are the different ways in which we can have it be a robust equity agreement right. that will adjust to any uncertainties rather than being blown up by it being a very fragile agreement. It's not quite a prenuptial agreement, but it's similar in concept in that you're anticipating that things may change, and if they do, let's have a discussion now so that we don't have to have the discussion then when things are crazy and the emotions are going to run havoc and put the business at risk. Absolutely. No, prenup has a lot of parallels to it. Yeah. There, the, the parallel that we don't want to bring up the conversation about what happens if things blow up. Sure. The last thing you want to do is do that with your fiance. The last thing you'll want to do is do that with your co-founder. Yeah. So, a whole bunch of other parallels to it where if we could go and have ourselves prepare for the unexpected and the downside, we'll be able to be a lot more robust in terms of how we'll be able to handle anything that's going to be coming our way down the road. There's just It strikes me that there's just so many things, Noam, that can tank the venture that have nothing to do with the product, the product market fit, the advertising, the name, it's all these people issues. And the biggest thing that strikes me after this conversation is that in the case of co-founders, which sounds like it's the vast majority, the willingness to engage in these very difficult discussions early on is just, it can't be, it can't be overstated. It's, it's, you've got to be willing to enter the danger with your co-founders and have these discussions. Yeah, no, absolutely. One of the key things, as you were just talking about, all sorts of things that founders have on their plates, have all sorts yeah. of worries about and things like that. It can't be that you're going to go and tackle all of them. Yeah. There's no way to go and take everything. When we're talking about risks in the, the equity split thing, you're never going to be able to take all 100 risks that you face and go and tackle them. But the enemy of that perfect solution of being able to tackle all of them can't be that we do nothing. Yeah. Go and prioritize those risks. Go and understand where are the places that teams go awry. Go and tackle at least the highest ranked ones yep. on that list yep. because A, you'll be able to hone your skills of being able to deal with those things together within the team. Right. And B, you'll be able to at least take those off your list so it can free you up to yep. take those skills at problem solving and interacting. And then when the unexpected hits down the road, you'll be much better able to go and recover and be able to go and deal with them. And so go and at least take the highest of these, educate yourself about what are the most common of them, 
go and tackle those, and that'll hopefully arm you for being able to be a much more robust entrepreneur as you go down the road. The conversation itself helps the odds of the venture by few, by forging together a better relationship with the, with the founders, the co-founders. Exactly. Great. If you can go, and it's in a lot of ways, these are issues that you could play with fire on them yeah. in terms of yeah. you could go and blow yourself up by not dealing with them well, but if you go and play with fire and it forges a stronger team yeah. and everyone's yeah. the better for it. Yeah. And to the extent that you can go and harness the ability to do it, inject in maybe a third person who will be able to tell you where are those playing with fire issues, right. go and have them facilitate those dialogues and force you to have them. You'll be much more robust, much more, uh, there's a book recently that was written that captures it for me, anti-fragile. Mm -hmm. You actually yep. gain strength rather than uh, that you're very fragile and blow up when adversity hits, that you gain strength from adversity. That's the anti-fragile approach, that if you can go and hone that as founders, you'll be much more likely to go and succeed within your venture. Your body of work has been fantastic, and I appreciate you taking the time. Um, how can people learn more about the book, your course, and, and just get in touch? Uh, well, the, the, the put up a site back when the book was coming out because I was getting a whole bunch of questions like that that people can go to noamwasserman.com where there's a bunch of resources there for them to be able to go and explore that. That's the best first point for okay. uh, being able to learn from those types of things. Great. Thank you so much for making the time. It's fascinating. I can't uh, impress upon founders enough to to read this and, and really take it to uh, he heed the advice because you are, you've been studying the data, like you said. And so you can kind of take out all the crap and the stories and the anecdotes and focus on what's, you know, what improves the odds of success in a venture. Thanks, Noam. Thanks, sir. My pleasure. Thanks for asking. Take care.